Now we are of course going to be starting with a look at agriculture. When Nigeria's government has signed an agreement with the African Exchange Holdings to create that country's first warehouse receipt system. That of course will enable farmers and cooperatives in Nigeria to store their produce at accredited warehouses and access credit more efficiently. A deal to that effect was signed at the 19th Nigerian Economic Summit and it is expected to attract more capital into agriculture. The system will go live in October in seven states and it will build on the experience of the East African Exchange in the Rwandan capital of Kigali. Through this plan, Nigeria's government hopes to improve access to markets for farmers, stabilize prices and raise incomes at the same time. Agri is not a social service. Agri is for business. You, know, you can make billions in Agri, and that is what people like us have bought into, and that is what encourages people the cost to invest in agriculture. And I believe that today, more Nigerians will see and begin to identify opportunities in Agri space. More Nigerians will become apostles and believe that indeed you can make a lot of money in agriculture while also touching human lives. It also allows the producer the ability then to store the product with integrity to sell when the market is at a better price. But on the other side of that, it allows the, 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 the processor or the buyer of agricultural product to know that the product that he's buying is in the condition that it should be and he pays the price and he knows he's getting that product. Now let's pull back a bit here. A decade after African countries agreed to dedicate at least 10% of their national budgets every single year to their respective agricultural sectors, just 10% of small-scale farmers across Africa have access to the financing they need to improve their output. Now, global demand for food set to rise by 30% in the next five years. Africa's lagging agricultural productivity is a significant problem. Now, those attending the 2013 Forum for the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa sought ways to solve this problem over the last few days. CCTV's Angela Coppola was there. Delegates at the African Green Revolution Forum in Maputo got to grips with many pressing issues, but at the core of the challenge is an understanding that if any policy is to work, it has to look at the big picture. There are one billion people on our continent. Once you cater for 70% or 80%, that means the continent is already catered for, and agriculture is a springboard for poverty eradication. In Mozambique, there is talk of linking the producers into the market to create agro-processing entrepreneurs. And there is an opportunity in the fortified bread sector where golden bread can be made with 38% sweet potato puree and 62% of wheat flour. And knowing that Mozambique is not a producer of wheat and most of this place distant from the capital gets the wheat flour at a very high cost, we could easily make a difference in, 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 in creating this, this market, in creating more demand for the farmers and in, in changing the life, livelihood of the farmer considerably by just producing orange flesh sweet potato. From a pan-African viewpoint, there are areas of concern, but these can be overcome. Taking successful case studies like the orange-faced sweet potato and implementing them in other countries. There are challenges, especially in technology uptake. There are challenges in resource flow in looking at the agriculture as a system. The farmer needs to be looked at holistically. Unless this 360 degree approach is taken when looking at smallholder farmers, it's unlikely that success stories and case studies can be emulated in other countries. And let's not forget the nutritional needs of the children, where many countries have high levels of vitamin A deficiency. Small-scale farming is probably the only way that the continent is going to be able to feed its people, but it's going to require a consolidated approach to policy and also a scientific approach to getting the right crops into the ground so that there isn't any failure. I'm Angelo Coppola for CCTV on the outskirts of Maputo. Still on agriculture, a delegation of researchers from right across East Africa are in Kenya to share their experiences on the marketing of high-value indigenous vegetables. Now, that project is being managed by the Association for Strengthening Agricultural Research in Eastern and Central Africa, better known by the acronym ASAREKA. It's part of a broader effort to strengthen data sharing on food security. Here's CCTV's Peter Okaba with more. It's early morning and a glance at Damson Maora's stall at the city park market in Kenya's capital Nairobi reveals a stall that looks no different from all the others around it. But there is a difference here. The stall specializes in indigenous African vegetables. The stock has just run out for the day. Rather early, you might say. In short, business has been good. 
business is really good. This business fulfills my financial needs. Demand is very high. Like now, my supply has run out. Danson gets his stock from a nearby farm on the outskirts of Nairobi. Farmers in the area have been quick to switch after noticing an uptick in demand. In the past, we grew items that relied on international or weak local markets. With these vegetables, local demand is very high. Sometimes we can't even meet demand. John is one of many farmers across Kenya and the East Africa region who are making it big in vegetable farming. In Kenya, for example, research shows that indigenous vegetables now account for 30% of all vegetables sold. Kenyan farmers are earning an average of $4,500 per annum from indigenous vegetable seed production. One exceptional farmer earned up to $17,000 in 2010. It is this success in Kenya that has other countries in the region keen to learn. One of the major problems the region is fighting is food insecurity and poverty. And this vegetable or this project supported by Asareka is aimed at trying to improve the food security of the people and also the incomes. A delegation comprising Ugandan, Rwandese and Burundian researchers has visited Kenya to learn the value chain model from seed propagation and sales, proper farming to marketing of the vegetables in order to enhance production and nutrition in their home countries. I am trying to learn about how they get seeds, how they, they, they make business with the, these indigenous vegetables. While demand for the produce has been quite high, the potential to meet the growing demand for these vegetables in the region is still limited by lack of good quality seed, a challenge that the current project seeks to meet. In the past, member countries of the East Africa community have had a major focus on political and economic integration, thus maybe neglecting the issue of food security. But with programs such as this now in place, the issue of food security may just start to become a priority. We talk about CCTV in Kabete in central Kenya. Now let's move on to South Africa with the National Union of Mine Workers. That's the largest union in South Africa's entire gold mining industry. Says its strike is ended at most mines. Now that in turn has raised hopes that it could be formally now called off. NUM at the same time has denied allegations that some of its members had intimidated and assaulted members of a rival union, the Association of Mine Workers and Construction Workers, AMCU, in the past couple of days. With the details, here's CCTV's Rene Del Carl. We are going to Marikana, sings this group of mine workers at a gold mine west of Johannesburg. Meaning that as far as they are concerned, the struggle of the miners who had lost their lives at Marikana continues. They say one of the main challenges facing the mining sector in South Africa is union rivalry. Until the beginning of this year, most workers here had belonged to the National Union of Mine Workers. But AMCU has slowly started making its presence felt. Like workers at Marikana and the Platinum Belt, many of these gold mine workers say they've decided to move from the NUM to AMCU. AMCU workers here say they were not on strike but claim that they're being prevented from going to work because of the alleged violence and intimidation by members of the National Union of Mine Workers. Our members were brutally beaten by the members of NUM. Uh, then they've been intimidated to go to work. And the problem is that uh, we could not get the transport to go to our workplace. NUM members, they're having traditional weapons to intimidate our members and to go out from their, from their hostels. Now, the security, they're very far away to protect the people. We were about to speak to some of the AMCO members who had allegedly been intimidated and assaulted. But we were instructed to stop filming by mine security. Meanwhile, the National Union of Mine Workers has dismissed AMCU's claims that tension between the two unions had once again led to violence, saying that AMCU was simply jealous of the NUM's success in this week's gold mine strike. Rene Dal Kam, CCTV, Johannesburg. Let's head over now to Johannesburg, where CCTV Sumitra Naidu is live tonight. Uh, Sumitra, this, of course, is a fast-moving situation in South Africa. Give us a broad summary of the industrial action across the various parts of South Africa's economy to date. 
Well, Rama, apart from the gold strike that looks like it could end pretty soon, a strike action in the construction and automotive sectors continues, and it looks like it's going to gain momentum next week. NUMSA, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, has issued a 48-hour strike notice to employers, saying that it will down tools next week, Monday. That's 300,000 of its members downing tools, affecting the retail motor industry. Industry, and this will include petrol attendance. So it's not looking good at this stage. Indeed. NUM spokesman Lucibe Sashoka earlier told uh, Power FM that the strike, quote, is partially over. Now, what exactly is the situation with respect to NUM's members who are in the gold sector right now? Well, you know, only the National Union of Mine Workers, their members, only their members went on a strike. The other union and the other uh, uh, workers didn't actually go on strike. But NUMA counts for 80,000 workers, and the Chamber of Mines confirmed uh, this afternoon that about 80% of all of those workers uh, that were on strike have uh, returned, and some of them will actually return at the night shift today. So uh, the only, all of the mines and uh, all of the mines have actually agreed with the union. The union has accepted an 8% a wage offer that was made by the employers. Uh, but Harmony is the only mine that's outstanding now. So those workers there, that's one of the bigger mines. Uh, of course, we're still waiting for news from uh, that uh, particular mine. Indeed. Let's focus on the storm clouds in the future, however. Amku so far has been quite critical of the deal that NUM has struck with the gold mining companies to date. Do we have any more clarity, however, on what their plans are moving forward? Will they, for example, ask their members to go on strike? Well, AMCO says that it is monitoring events at the Chamber of Mines. It will continue to see what comes out of that. Of course, it is watching uh, the deal that was struck by NUM with most of the mining companies today for that 8% uh, wage offer. But it says that it, it will this weekend make a decision on whether it will go on strike action. It is holding a rally this weekend. So it, it, it's expected to make a decision after that rally on a Sunday. So we'll probably uh, hear more more from that. Uh, but of course, they account for 17% of uh, the uh, gold workers uh, in this sector. Indeed. We'll have to leave it there for the time being, though. Thank you very much for that update. That's CCTV Sumitra and I to live in Johannesburg, South Africa. Just for the record, AMCO, of course, is demanding a 150% hike in basic wages for its workers. Whether or not that will be the case, we'll have to wait and see until on Sunday next week. Now, on to South Sudan Central Bank. It has asked foreign commercial banks there to pay $30 million in share capitalization. That's twice the initial minimum requirement. Domestic ones, however, based only a share capital requirement of $15 million. According to the bank's governor, Cornelio Coriom Mayik, the move is aimed at enabling commercial banks to avoid irregularities noted in the supply of hard currency allocated by the central bank. Now, the bank has been restricting hard currency access to basic needs like health, food items and education as the country grapples with irregularity. The proceeds from oil, which used to be the main source of funds, for the national budget and foreign currency. Now, the governor said some banks are using hard currency for purposes which, in the central bank's opinion, are not critical to the Sudan's purposes. Ratings agency Fitch has revised Uganda's outlook to positive from stable. It has also reaffirmed its long-term foreign and local currency issuer default ratings at a flat B. Now, the London and New York-based agency also affirmed Uganda's country ceiling at B. The revision follows Uganda's track record of robust growth, averaging 7% for more than a decade now. That, in turn, has lifted two-thirds of Uganda's population out of abject poverty. Fitch notes that the growth has been supported by strong export performance. Exports, of course, have gone up from 10% of GDP in 2002 to 22% last year. The completion of the Bujagali power station also boosted overall GDP growth to 5.1% in 2012 by improving power supply. Fitch expects growth to rise above 7% per year by 2015. Time for a short break here on Africa Life. Here's what's coming up next. The G20 Leader Summit has come to an end in Russia. We'll be live in St. Petersburg next for analysis on what the policies made there mean for you in Africa.
Biz Asia. Asia means business. Now, the G20 summit in Russia concluded with an observation that while the global economy is improving, it's still too early to declare an end to the economic crisis, with the emerging markets facing quite a bit of increasing volatility. Now, leaders of that group, which has economies accounting for about 80% of global GDP and two-thirds of the world's population, acknowledged the troubles faced by some emerging nations, but they said it was up to them first and foremost to put their own houses in order. Now, the state which met in St. Petersburg in Russia struggled to find common ground with the turbulence unleashed by the prospects of the United States unwinding its quantitative easing program. A communique issued at the end of the two-day summit struck closely to the statement issued by finance ministers in July, demanding the changes to monetary policy be carefully calibrated and, this is a really important part, clearly communicated. The G20 meetings in Russia attracted worldwide attention, not just on Syria, as we mentioned earlier in the bulletin, but on economic issues facing the world economy as a whole. Emerging markets were a key focus of the final day, with concerns raised about market volatility, in particular reference to currencies. African economies cannot escape the impact of a slowdown around the world. But, as CCTV's Yasso Kim now reports, Africa's representation in global economic governance is still a big problem. The G20 leaders have met against the grandeur of St. Petersburg, but it's on the streets of places like Cairo where decisions on the global economy will be felt the most. According to UNICEF, Africa accounts for 14% of the global population, many of them young and unemployed. One third of Africa has a growth rate of over 6%. That is great potential. At the abundance of oil, gas, minerals, as well as the increasingly skilled workers, this continent can easily be the driving force for the global economy in the future. Therefore, one African seat in the G20 has been seen by analysts as underestimating the importance of Africa and its weight in the global economy. The continent is full of problems, such as unemployment, corruption, political instability and abuse of its resources. Many of the problems are caused by the developed countries, especially the West. So it is in their benefit that Africa doesn't have enough power in the G20. Emerging markets dominated the economic agenda at the G20 summit, with less developed countries at risk of slowing due to tighter U.S. monetary policy. These problems, some analysts say, are intentionally not given much attention by most developed countries. Egypt is an example. Egypt's economic figures were as good as many of the countries in the G20. But now, when Egypt is in recession, the Western countries are pulling out their aid and blocking the IMF and the World Bank from supporting us unless we abide by their politics. The same goes with several Middle East and North African countries. According to the timetable, the roadmap should be complete by mid-2014. But fearing that the government would fall behind schedule, there are suggestions awaiting approval to combine both the parliamentary and presidential elections in one process. Yasser Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. But then let's head over to St. Petersburg. CCTV's Guan Chin has been covering developments at the G20 summit over the last couple of days. She joins us now live from that Russian city. Uh, Guan, give us a summary of the key economic decisions made at the summit today. Our G20 leaders adopted the St. Petersburg action plan today uh, here and they're vowing to boost the growth and create jobs especially for the young unemployed and they're also calling for uh, sound and sustainable public finances a clear perception that growth based on that are not sustainable but there is no binding target so just sort of a resolution and they also ref uh, confirmed the importance of free and open trade as an important source of growth and how they're opposing to trade protectionism and they also agree on combating tax evasion by setting up a, a tax information automatic exchange system from the year 2015 among G20 members and also progress has been made on a continued reform of the financial regulations such as regulating the shadow banking sector which is estimated at 60 trillion US dollars 
globally. And this is going to be the first set of global rules to uh, reining the systematic risks in the future. Back to you. Indeed. Let's address some of that vagueness, Ivan. The declaration the G20 leader said, and I'm quoting here, we must move forward in fighting base erosion and profit-shifting practices. Now, beyond the action plan proposed by the OECD, what exactly does that mean in policy terms? Well, that is referring to efforts to combat tax evasion practices by multinational companies. Uh, it aims to close the loopholes for multinational companies which are making profits somewhere but channeling their profits to some remote small islands where they pay little taxes and this is going to uh, cost trillions of dollars of losses for both developed and developing countries. As I mentioned, G20 members agreed to set up a system for automatic sharing of tax information among G20 members. This is going to look, close the loophole for, for that. And G20 members agreed to work out the detailed plan throughout 2014 and put the system in place by the end of 2015. Analysts say the timeline seems very ambitious and there are a lot of details need to be worked out in the future. Back to you. Indeed, those details are certainly something we're looking forward to seeing here. Finally, though, did the American government offer any clarity on its unwinding of its QE program? A lot of the statements and sentiments around the G20 summit really were aimed at that lack of clarity and transparency from Washington. Well, in, an, in a report that accompanied the action plan, the U.S. Federal Reserve stated uh, it made it clear that it will continue its asset purchase program until there are substantial improvements of the job market and uh, in the context of pricing stability. And G20 also made a statement on that. And they say they're committed to cooperate to ensure that policies uh, implemented to support domestic growth should also support global growth and financial stability and manage their spillover effects on other countries. Back to you. Indeed, we'll have to leave it there for the time being. Thank you very much for that. That's CCTV's Guan Chin in St. Petersburg in Russia, where the G20 summit, of course, has come to a close. Now, for years, South Africa's vibrant wine industry has tried to evade perceptions of being a new world product. It essentially points out that we've got a heritage spanning some 300 years. This is an industry, of course, famous for its Cabinet Sauvignons and its Pinot Noirs. And the Western Cape is home to almost the country's entire wine industry. It enjoys significant support from locals and tourists alike and is home to the birthplace of the country's first ever wine estate. As CCTV's Travis Andrews now explains. If you fancy a tipple of fine red wine, then you need go no further than the Western Cape's famed wine growing region. At the Kruid Constantia Wine Estate, which is the oldest winery in South Africa, the remnants of its earliest beginnings remain. While South African historical figure Simon van der Staal's homestead stands as a testament to the origins of the region's wine heritage, old-fashioned perceptions continue to plague the country's wine industry. What we do in South Africa is not much different to what they do in Australia or New Zealand. It's obviously just uh, soil types. And then we also sit at the, at the crossroad because we are in a new world wine growing region or country. South Africa is considered new world. Um, but we've been doing wine for 328 years, so is that really new world? While South African wine exports account for around 3.3% of global sales, the industry has seen growth of around 40% since the beginning of the year owing to a successful harvest and a weaker end. The geographical land of the Western Cape also helps in producing a soil that is perfect especially for red wine production and not even unpredictable weather patterns have hampered a bumper harvest. The changes in the climate of, of late have not, have not affected us negatively, in fact it's affected us quite positively. Um, the, the, the cooler climate helps us with the white wines um, the higher rainfalls help us with, the, with the, the richness of the soils for the red wines. So, yeah, we, we're not crying about climate change right now. Wine tasting in itself has become a proven tourist attraction, judging by the annual influx of tourists wanting to indulge themselves in their favorite SA Red. The country's wine industry seems to be on a steady footing. The wine media has been drunk and enjoyed around the world, but this is also a monument, and 300,000 visitors come here each year to pay homage to the birthplace of South African wine. Travis Andrews, CCTV, Cape Town.
Now, the snapshot, of course, on how markets performed across the continent essentially suggests that markets ended the, day, the week rather with a whimper and not quite the bang some might have expected. The all-share index in Nigeria, of course, ending the day down by about two-tenths. The uh, all-share index in South Africa also in the red, relatively flat, quite frankly. Uh, the 20-share index, however, consolidating the gains we've seen over the last three trading sessions, ending the day a fraction under quarter. This being a Friday, of course, the Egyptian market is closed. On to the sports now with Penny now.